This episode is brought to you by Asana, the project management tool that organizes your work so your teams know what to do, why it matters, and how to get it done. The inspiration came from a program that President Roosevelt ran in the United States in, during the 1930s, during the Great Depression, where in nine years' time, three million unemployed men were mobilized, were coordinated by the U.S. Army, and planted over three billion trees. So it's the largest environmental conservation effort in history that at the same time created jobs and economic opportunities. So you could almost say that a blueprint for what I envisioned was inspired by something that was already there. So the basic idea was there. And I thought if this could work in the 1930s on land, surely it can work now at sea in this modern day setting. So it's a lot of thinking around, well, what kind of ships do you then use? How are they financed? How do we get the approval from government? How do we create a role like a sea ranger that is interesting for young people that you know also pushes their personal development? Welcome to Mission First, the podcast to learn from successful entrepreneurs changing the world for the better. Are you in the first three years of your company? And do you want to save time by avoiding making the same mistakes that lots of entrepreneurs have already done? Then make sure to follow this podcast because you are going to get actionable strategies coming directly from those who have found product market fit and are scaling up fast with their for-profit companies or their NGOs. Think about it as a masterclass about product innovation, business models, leadership, and growth marketing. Bonjour, bonjour. I am Gilles Toussaint. I help entrepreneurs have a bigger impact with this podcast, and I also help mission-driven companies increase their revenue more efficiently with growth marketing and my company, GT Impact. Are you dreaming of having a social impact on the world? Or are you dreaming about having a sustainable environmental impact on the world? Well, do you know it's possible to achieve both? Today, I have the chance to talk to Witzer van der Werf, CEO and founder of Sea Ranger Service. Sea Ranger Service is a social enterprise with a mission to restore 1 million hectares of ocean biodiversity by 2040, whilst training 20,000 young people towards a maritime career. When the common advice for entrepreneurs is to focus on one product only, Witzer developed successfully three products slash services with this social enterprise. From marine research services to offering a boot camp to train people for a new career, and also the construction and design of a new ship certified in the industry with a zero emission specification. Witzer prepared a list of very hands-on tips about how to create a company with a social and environmental impact, so I can't wait to start digging into this interview with him. For the first time since the beginning of Mission First, this episode is brought to you by a sponsor. I will only accept sponsors that I truly believe in. I started using Asana when I was the CMO in my previous company. Why? Because I was forced to, to be honest. Forced by the CEO because it was the project management tool that they were already paying for when I arrived. I was so used to Trello that I was not a big fan of moving to another project management tool. But you know what? I loved it and I found it so useful that I became the official ambassador of Asana in the company. I helped implementing it across multiple sites and with more than 30 people. And at the end, it paid off very well. We almost stopped using internal emails and all communication was going through the relevant tasks in Asana. Onboarding of new employees was almost automated with templates in Asana. Our meetings and OKRs were managed efficiently there, filled in before the meeting offline, saving us incredible amounts of time in meetings and making us way more efficient to reach our deadlines. Since then, I keep using Asana for all my projects, including now to manage all the marketing strategy projects I run with my clients. In this episode, you will also hear how Witzer, the guest of this episode and his team, are also using Asana in order to manage their projects and how Asana helps them to efficiently restore the ocean. Witzer, thank you very much for being here today. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for your time. I'm very excited. So you are the founder of Sea Ranger Service and you have this fantastic mission of restoring 1 million hectares of ocean biodiversity while training dozens of thousands of people towards a maritime career. So can you tell us a bit more about this mission and how far you are right now? Well, I mean, I mean very simply put, I guess many of us have heard of 
you know, plastics pollution and overfishing and the fact that we need to think about protecting our ocean for future generations. And unfortunately, when you approach governments with a story just about protecting oceans for nature's sake, that's a little bit difficult to get really bigger, bigger support for that we need. The oceans are very big. So I started looking at a very different issue, and that is that in most port cities and coastal communities, the unemployment is very high. So what if we can protect the oceans, restore nature, but that at the same time, that creates the jobs and economic opportunities for young people in these coastal communities? And then, of course, politically, you have far stronger backing, and you can really think about a large-scale restoration of the biodiversity uh, in the ocean. So as you think previously said, very much about a combined social and environmental impact. Simply put, when we started this, people thought we were pretty crazy because, you know, restoring the oceans is a huge undertaking. Operating ships, building ships, which we do, training staff, uh, operating at sea. And we often joke that besides from starting an airline or going into space, this is pretty much the most capital intensive type of operation you can start. But we managed to get through that. And with initial support and with investment, bit by bit, it's now expanding internationally. And this seems to be a model that is very applicable and increasingly is now replicated in other parts of Europe and beyond. So it's a very exciting time. And you know we just went ahead and, and did this with an amazing team over the last five and a half years. And I think only now are we starting to talk to other people about what we've done and how this potentially could be relevant to others as well, you know, who want to make an, uh, an environmental impact. Then thank you. I'm glad that uh, I'm part of the people you are telling that story to. In terms of size, can you tell us a bit more? What is your team size right now in terms of full-time employees? What is the revenue you are aiming at and, and what kind of impacts if you have already measured? I've seen that your zero emission vessels that, for example, they, they consume 94% less fuel and emit 94.6% less CO2 than traditional motorized vessels. We'll get back to that into detail. But in, in a nutshell, can you tell us a bit more about your impact in terms of team, revenue and environmental impact? Sure, yeah. So we started in 2016 with just the operation, simply getting things prepared. And only from 2018 did we start operationally. Until then, we've trained just under 100 people as sea rangers, with about half of them going into longer term maritime jobs. Last year, revenue was just under half a million euros. This year, we're, we'll be very close to a million. So actually, we're sort of expanding in size quite drastically at the moment. We currently have a full-time staff of 27 people, and we're about to close a big investment round to also be able to now scale to a number of other countries, uh, where most likely the UK, United Kingdom, will be the first area where we expand into. And really, we are currently... You know, maybe another way to, to approach the impact currently, we sort of semi-permanently monitor and manage roughly an area of 10,000 square kilometers in the North Sea. And we work with five Dutch government agencies and a number of other partners to do so. And in four of those five cases, we are contracted by government agencies for work that has never, ever been contracted out to external people. So I think in terms of impact as well, it's very much about opening up a new type of market working as a social business with government in a way that commercial businesses really cannot. Also, it's interesting that even as a social business, that kind of impact is increasing. It's initially difficult to measure, but yeah, increasingly we are doing very unique and pioneering uh, work. I like to try to you know, visualize the impact in that case. When you said you already have monitoring about 10 square kilometer of ocean right now, and you are aiming at 1 million hectares uh, by 2040, what is 10 square kilometers. How can you visualize that? Yeah, so that's roughly the Dutch North Sea area. So if you look at the Netherlands and you pretty much take the size of the country and you put that into the North Sea, that's roughly the area that is the Dutch North Sea area, if you put it very simply put. It's, I mean, it's often difficult to really imagine. The ocean is so big. So ultimately, of course, what we're looking at, and that's something we only this year started working on the seagrass restoration work that took a few years to prepare. And ultimately, the, the amount of hectares that we restore actively, the biodiversity we bring back underwater, plus the amount of jobs we create and young people we get into employment, that's really the impact goal we're looking for. So there are all these other associated goals. And of course, if you're talking about monitoring an area of ocean, that doesn't mean you actively restore that entire ocean area. But it might mean, for example, our ships operate in these areas. We also have partners that help us with satellite tracking whereby we, from space, we can collect the data that looks at where certain ships are operating 
also potentially illegally, sort of a semi-permanent smart type of monitoring. We are able to affect in an area, whereas if you traditionally only had one patrol ship go in, it would be very costly, quite polluting. And of course, there wouldn't be that social impact of training young people at the same time. So that's definitely, you could say, the sort of unique selling point to governments and also some commercial clients is saying, hey, we can go to sea. We have a certified ship. We can do all types of work, research, monitoring, surveying, maintenance, restoration of, of on the water landscape. We can do so cleaner, cheaper, and with social uh, impact. And in fact, some of those young people we train also then working for the government agencies that actually contract us to do other types of work. So it's a very sort of holistic uh, approach in that sense. When you say you are not restoring yet, it's a personal question here. What are your plans to restore the oceans? So really the restoration is focused on three pillars, the restoration of oysters, seagrass, and corals. Oysters are amazing because they actually clean water. They essentially filter seawater. So where, you know, especially coastal areas where there's a lot of oyster beds or even further down, water quality just tends to be uh, a lot better. Seagrass is quite amazing and has really a superpower as a climate mitigator because there is a natural form of carbon sequestration. That essentially means that the seagrass takes carbon, stores that and turns that into oxygen. We've lost a lot of our seagrasses. This is due to destructive fishing in coastal areas where nets are dragged on the seabed, but also sites where a lot of sailing ships are where they use anchors and those anchors drag on the seabed. So it's about re regenerating these areas of, of seagrass. And seagrass actually is primed to a prime candidate for restoration because actually you can collect seeds, you can prepare sort of ways to actually pl actively plant that. So you can very methodically around the coast bring those seagrass meadows back. And finally, coral reefs, really one of the key change in, in an ecosystem where around those corals, lots of smaller species attract larger species. And you know that whole kind of marine food chain often very much depends on things like coral reefs, but also seagrass and oyster beds. So where we've lost that, that nature, essentially, it's about putting that back. And uh, for example, corals... I watched these documentaries a couple of years ago with the whitening of the corals. What are the solutions now that are already there that can be used to restore corals? So this is an amazing thing. With, with a bit of a helping hand, and in the case of corals, that actually that you can take small pieces of coral and you can essentially, in a type of nursery, similar to plants, you're able to, uh, to replicate those and, and grow little bits of coral into slightly bigger pieces that can then be planted on the seabed to develop further. Now, with the Sea Ranger Service, we are not the scientists necessarily that know all about this. And this is exactly the reason we started. Because what we see all over the world is that there are really knowledgeable people who start amazing conservation projects. And ultimately, the one thing they all struggle with is how do we then scale up this solution? And scaling up a solution for the oceans pretty much always means you need ships and you need people. And how do you run a sort of service of, in our case, sea rangers that are permanently at sea, that have workshops that can do all this work? And how do you make sure that that is financed in a sustainable way? Because many of these projects are just reliant on philanthropic, like grant money and donations. And that's no way to scale these programs to the point where we really make, have them making bigger impact. So that's what the sea ranger service is about, it's essentially saying, how can we fix this issue of getting more ships and people out into the ocean, build a whole fleet of conservation ships around the world, and make sure that private finance, that new type of revenue models, underpin the scaling of such a resource that can ultimately benefit many organizations and smaller businesses around the world. To bring the operations to the scientists yeah. and the... bring the capacity. Yeah, yeah. The capacity. absolutely. Yeah. And so it's also, we, often, we, we sometimes refer to it as a, how do you lower the barrier to entry? Because you can stand on the beach and you can, you know, you might be able to fundraise for a small boat, but then you can maybe go like a few kilometers out of the coast, a few miles. And, and you know, but we have to go further. But that's where, where our sea range is coming. Let's talk about how you started the company. You've been in the environmental conservation for more than 25 years and you actually have been awarded the Future for Nature Award for your innovative conservation efforts. And you received a grant of 50,000 euro. And this is how basically you started Sea Ranger Service in that time in 2016. Can you, in a nutshell, for the people listening to us who haven't created the company yet, explain us a bit 
the company incorporation, the few steps, who you contact, how many people were there at the very beginning for the first few months until the companies incorporate? Yeah, so I'd worked in ocean issues for many years. I investigated illegal fishing for many years and just dealing with so few few resources and very limited uh, capacity. So this was in my head for a long time. And actually the inspiration came from a program that President Roosevelt ran in the United States in, during the 1930s, during the Great Depression, where in nine years' time, three million unemployed men were mobilized, were coordinated by the U.S. Army, and planted over three billion trees. So the largest environmental conservation effort in history that at the same time created jobs and economic opportunities. So you could almost say that a blueprint for what I envisioned was inspired by something that was already there. So the basic idea was there. And I thought if this could work in the 1930s on land, surely it can work now at sea in this modern day setting. So it's a lot of thinking around, well, what kind of ships do you then use? How are they financed? How do we get the approval from government? How do we create a role like a sea ranger that is interesting for young people that you know also pushes their personal development? So all of these things, it's really taken a lot of people that have helped think with me and our team about this. And from the very start, I just talked to a lot of people about this idea. I literally met, I mean, I must have met like over 200 people in the first sort of year, just talking with them, just saying, what do you think about this idea? And what was really I would say crucial in the success for us was that we decided not to work with like-minded people. And that sounds strange when I say this, but when, you know, it's, it's really, of course, empowering when I meet other people that care about ocean conservation and we sit together and we make plans on how to better protect the ocean. But if I have to build ships and I have to train sea rangers and I have to get government contracts, who I actually need are veterans that can train the sea rangers that have certain skills. I need shipbuilders that can build ships. I need bankers on the finance side and I need civil servants to come on board, you know, to think about how they can contract us from a government perspective. So suddenly you're in a very much more conservative part of society that actually, if I go to these shipbuilders and military veterans and I say, hey, we have to protect the ocean, you know, put a little bit harshly, these people don't really care about that sort of stuff. But what they do care about is the fact that you are giving young people new perspective and that you employ veterans to train sea rangers, that you innovate in shipbuilding and, and even zero emission ships is something you can develop. So I think I've, I've become better at really thinking what is it that we need and who are the people that are best placed to help us and how do you appeal to the intrinsic motivation of those people? I, I don't need to convince anyone about our mission. You know, I don't need to convince people. It's a mission that's so it's a little bit broader and allows lots of people to find what they're good at or what their passion is inside that mission. And that has meant that from the start, it was you know very broadly supported, even from more conservative politicians, even from maritime businesses. And that also meant that on the first day when we announced that we were going to start this, we had the mayor of Rotterdam, the CEO of the port of Rotterdam. This is the largest industrial port in, in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, they stood on stage and they backed the program and and then things sort of, you know, developed from, from there onwards. And as you say, luckily, I was I was sort of awarded this Future for Nature Award that had a bit of first starting capital. And that allowed us to then get a little bit more investment in from others. And that's how we got the ball, uh, the ball rolling. Let's start with the, the do's and don'ts that you sent me so on the topic of how to create a company with an environmental and social impact combined. And the first one you told me was resist the core focus trap. Uh, so yeah. maybe you can detail me a bit that and yeah. you talk about products, I guess. Yeah, no, for sure. So maybe it's good to clarify really briefly. We essentially do three things. We train young people as sea rangers. So those can also be unemployed people that we help towards this, these, these trainings. We then build special ships, zero emissions. So they're like sailing ships but they are certified as commercial offshore workships. And the third thing we do is that we then offer all kinds of services at sea. So we fly with drones, we use underwater robots, we do research, different things, and services we provide. So in the beginning, when I would discuss this with people, people looked at me and they were like, you know, you're, come on, you are crazy. Like, choose one thing. 
you know, urinals go to build ships and work with governments and train rangers. And that's like, you know, this too, too crazy. And perhaps my youthful enthusiasm, that's just me as a person, how I am, and the ambition of the program would be perceived as naivety. So especially in that maritime industry, you know, a lot of sort of middle-aged white guys would like tap me on the back saying, oh, sure you are, you know, very sympathetic <laughs> idea. <laughs> and it's like, well, no, actually, I want you to invest. I want you to come on board. So that, you know, that idea of only focus on one thing, I don't think always holds true. It needs to be realistic, but it can be that actually you do two things at the same time or that there is a combination of factors that make it extra strong. And interestingly, in the industry of shipbuilding, we do something really unique because we develop a new type of zero emission ship and that ship then goes on to be used straight away for all types of innovations, and the feedback of, of the, the, the using that ship at sea can feed back information about developing the new ship. So it, it's also in each of the industries we work because we have a slightly broader focus. It just means that there's more depth to our mission and what we're working towards. In the timeline, it seemed clear that you started with offering a service to restore the sea and to help the cycle, the marine research, marine area monitoring, and the boot camp that you, you started to train the sea rangers. But where is, was the ship building and design part of the really initial like things you've done as a vision, but also like, practically, have you, have you started to focus yeah. on the three things in parallel or was there a specific order? Yeah. So I thought what we do is we first build a ship, we then find the contract, and then we train our sea rangers and start the work. But actually, it turns out that everything happens exactly the other way around. <laughs> so what we have to do is we have to first train sea rangers. And then in government, people said, oh, you're training sea rangers. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the minister doesn't want to be left behind. So actually, <laughs> you know, they literally told us, like, if you had written a plan and you would have gone everywhere to ask for support, nothing would have happened. But because you simply started it and because we see these young people and, you know, so that actually gained us the contract and we used sort of temporary, we hired a, another type of sailing ship to do the work. And only now are we able to realize the financing through a bank to then build the uh, new ship. I don't want any philanthropic or grant money or donations to go into building a ship because I need to prove that our business model is strong enough for a bank, a traditional bank to say, you are now at the level you know, where we can just use bank financing to do the shipbuilding. And that's so crucial because it's a validation of the business model going forward. And if that works once, as our revenue stream grows and our portfolio of clients, we can build more ships because the financing is more readily available. Low interest banking finance. So yeah, we also, even though there's been some grant money in the beginning and donation just to, get, to help us get started, we are now very strict on, on making sure that You know, our ongoing operation is not financed except through, you know, the revenue we generate and maybe some investment. But we have to keep that very uh, validation of the business case. Are important. you already cash flow positive now? Cash flow positive, yes. Uh, we haven't broke broke even. That's still, I would say, about a year and a half down the line. There's, of course, a lot of upfront investment needed to start this kind of operation. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, I wouldn't say it's always been easy, for sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're... We're strong and, and, and it's growing, it's, it's expanding. So it's a very exciting time. So you said initially you had a couple of grants, then investment, and now banks soon, and you're starting a bigger investment uh, round right now. What, what is the proportion in the timeline of grants versus investors versus banks? Yeah, so I would say the first three years, but that was even a small team. That was even, there were no sea rangers. We didn't have a, our ship ready yet. So I would say the two, first two and a half, three years, It was some grant money, some early investment, uh, and like 80% of that would be grant money and 20% investment. And then after, in I would say the fourth year, when we started our operation, that almost changed. Like three quarters would be investment and a quarter would be grant money. And now, um, you know, in our fifth year, it's like a third of it is contracted income and the rest is investment. And this year it even moves on. So now just over half of our income this year will be covered by our revenue our contracted work so it keeps moving along in that in that regard and i think and that's fair i mean we have definitely attracted sort of social impact type investors that understand this that are willing to make available like long-term like patients capital 
uh, that don't necessarily seek a return within a few years. So we're allowed to to develop and pioneer and, and, and build this up. And I think everyone is confident by the fact that they keep seeing that even all of those government contracts we obtained that started as small pilot contracts, every year now they're expanded and the work expands as well as the revenue that generates. So that is, I think, the strongest validation of the fact that um, the model works. It's just a question of scaling it and, and making sure we keep attracting those uh, those new and additional clients. I think when you are mentioning it, a, a very important factor here is also the way you structure the company. Because you're talking about business model, but I really like that on your website, so crangers.org, there is a, a governance in the about pages where it, it's not very often that I see that when you clearly see that you have basically created one, two, three, four, five companies. Can you explain us a bit? So you have one main one, which is a foundation, then one holding BV, like another one, which is a for-profit one, and then you have a series of other for-profit ones. So can you yeah. explain us a bit how this works and yeah. the different business models of yeah. both and the advantage? Yeah. And, and so we are a social business, a social enterprise. And to me it was very crucial that if we are going to get support from government, from other maritime companies, if, if there is a strong social element to this work, actually, I don't, even though I started it, I don't want to, you know, have some kind of exit with me making a lot of money personally. In fact, it's about the impact. And we can make that impact because a lot of people are investing, not just money, but also investing time, effort, expertise. There's a lot of corporates who are supporting us in many ways to get this business model up and running. So I decided that the business would be owned by a nonprofit. And all that means is that we have strong independent governance. So even though I'm the CEO of the company, I have to report to an independent board. And I actually think that's good because we have, you know, developing something like this, there's a lot of challenges involved. And I like the fact that I have a good sounding board. And I have a board that, you know, they're not just yaysayers. So they're critical, they give critical feedback, but they also let me and the team be entrepreneurs and move forward. So at the top is a foundation, a nonprofit, a charity that owns our company. And the company is essentially a holding company under which the different activities we organize in different companies. And there's a fair practical reason for this. If we are building ships and we are organizing the ownership of these ships in separate companies, that is essentially a sort of industry standard that also to ensure limited liability for if anything happens with the ship that is organized, it's, the ownership is taken care of in a separate company. So yeah, we have Sea Ranger ships and all our shipbuilding falls under Sea Ranger ships. The training of young people, the boot camp, working with the veterans to train the youth, working, getting contracts from local municipalities, that is Sea Ranger boot camp. So that's where we do all of our training, personal development. And then Sea Ranger service, which is also our core brand, that is really for the offshore services and that operates the ships at sea. So we also have different teams within the company that yeah, take care of these different entities. And over time, as things grow, there is no reason why our boot camp couldn't train maybe people at other companies to do similar work. Or our ship's company could build a ship as a commission for another organization because they want this type of new type of ship for their research work, for example. You know, those are possibilities. So we have sort of growth plans for these individual companies, but we still make sure that all of it falls under the holding company and ultimately our nonprofit. And so with that, you have the pros of being able to receive like funds and donations and grants from government in the nonprofit Sea Ranger Foundation. And then you have the, the holding company, which is a for-profit where you can make the profit flow from all the, the subsidiary companies into that one and you can balance the profit as you want between these companies to scale them up. And do you also reinvest a part of the profit in the nonprofit? No, so really the nonprofit invests all of its work back into the business entities. Uh, the nonprofit doesn't do anything else. It doesn't have its own programs. Uh, it's really there to make sure there's strong governance. And it, it'll always, you know, the, we're in a financing round now, and, and it's sort of, you could call it an A series. It's the first time we also give out equity in the company, but it's a minority equity we give out to other shareholders. So our foundation, our nonprofit is still the majority shareholder. And yeah, and going forward, really, it, it's also ensuring that the different entities that the holding company as well as the nonprofit, make sure, as you say, that it profits flow back into the work, strengthen our mission, and ultimately increase the amount of impact we can make. 
this is something very common that I heard from like a lot of people on this podcast. In any case, to be successful, to have a really high impact, usually you have to find a business model that is based on profit in order to be able to scale. And I have to say, I mean, a funny anecdote, a few, a few years ago, I, I had a lunch with some maritime CEOs in, in the, the port of Rotterdam, and they are called the port barons, because this is like sort of old industrial money in, in the port of Rotterdam. And I presented the work, and they didn't quite understand it. I think it's also a generational thing, but ultimately, well, during the lunch after, one of the men he asked me, he was, he was like, well, so you, just to understand this, you build up your own business, and then... When it's successful, you don't earn yourself a lot of money. And I was like, no, I want to, you know, it's about the impact. I want to make the impact. And they looked at me and they thought I was totally crazy because they were like, what is impact? Like, <laughs> they just didn't understand. So I think there's also a new breed of entrepreneur who is just focused on fixing kind of a societal or in this case, an environmental issue and finding a new model where that impact can be generated and where it counts most. So I think that's also in, something in the intrinsic motivation of me and I think also other entrepreneurs where... Yeah, that, that, that's just, that takes center stage above anything, anything else, the impact. If you are busy and might not have the time to listen to this full episode or to all episodes of this podcast, just a little tip. Sign up for my newsletter on gtimpact.com. You will receive the summary of advice from each episode and you will get personal recommendations on which episode you should focus on depending on your current challenges, your industry and your startup stage. There is a question at the top of my, my mind right now is beside combining impact and social impact and sustainable impact, is it possible to combine that with money at the same time? Because in a way, I also have some people I talk from nonprofit and they work the ass off for that. And sometimes they are because it's a nonprofit, they're limited by, for example, the amount of money they can get as a CEO compared to you know, a, a for profit company. Is it also something that in terms of all the roles in the company, also people working for, for nonprofits, sometimes they are not so well paid because it's not a you know, market depending type of company, which has a lot of profits. So is it also something that you can use in that way, be able to pay the people in any role better than they would be in a nonprofit? I think we are paying better than in a, in a standard nonprofit. Also, of course, because we have to attract a lot of you know, really good people to make this fly. In fact, people that just have non-profit expertise is not going to cut it. We need people with the business expertise. And especially in the maritime industry, of course, you know, these people, it's at a, it's at a different standard and that's understandable. It, interestingly, everybody that works with us quit a good time, uh, like a good job in order to start working for us. So we also have a lot of people that are very intrinsically motivated for this mission who are kind of saying, wow, if this can work, you know, wow, that, that would be really something and I want to make it possible. So, um, but of course, you know, it, it's about it's about the long-term sustainability of how you run an organization, right? I don't really have, have a lot of value in people coming in for a couple of years and then moving on. I need to make sure people are happy, that we have a really inspiring and empowering and very supportive work culture within the company and make sure there are strong values that people get behind. And then what you see is if you look after people, they look after you because they work, you know, so incredibly hard. So our team is just is amazing and would never be able to do it without all of us collectively. And that brings me to the second advice you sent me, which is don't be drawn into market fit thinking. <laughs> okay, this is, yeah, I mean, this, this is funny, right? And it may, it, I don't think it's relevant in, in all scenarios, and, uh, but it, it's perhaps good to explain. So typically, I think people, and I, I never studied business school, but when I meet sort of business advisors, one of the first things they'll say is, you know, when you do your research to set up your enterprise or your business, go into the market, find a need, make sure that you have a product that customers want today that you can put, on the, put out there and that you can sell. It's just about selling. And we did something the entire opposite because we essentially developed a product. When we went to clients, they said, well, we don't need this. You know, they were sort of skeptical. They were like, oh, okay, um, yeah, I don't know, we don't budget for this. And that sounds maybe strange, but now after two, three years, we educated our potential clients. And this is government agencies, some commercial maritime firms, where for the first time, they're now seeing potential and they're seeing impact and they're seeing the relevance of the services we provide. So we opened up a new market by essentially saying, this is something that doesn't exist yet, but we think it could really make a difference to how you run. And in the case of government agencies where they have to cut carbon emissions, 
where they have a big challenge on recruiting young people to come into their agency to work on the ships and also where they have limited budgets. Again, because we operate the ship cleaner, cheaper, and by training people at the same time, that gives three impacts that ultimately count. But you know, if we would have just looked at the market and thought, how do I have a product that fits in here today? It wouldn't have worked. We had to educate the market. We had to bring people along in the story and really make them understand that this is a bit of out-of-the-box thinking, but it can work. And of course, the first meetings with governments and, and at the agencies, I mean, you know, people looked at us and they were like, okay, like young people on a sailing boat protecting nature, very sympathetic. We'll make a donation. That's the first reaction. And then it's saying like, well, actually, no, because it's a business and you explain all this. And then it really has taken two, three years to get potential clients up to the level where they're now saying, wow, now we really understand how this works and we want it. So in order to create this blue ocean, get out of the red ocean where everybody tries to be as well, how did you educate them? You talked about you need to educate them. And I think for any cutting edge new products, but also new services, you, you need to educate the persons and there are different yeah. ways to do that. But what was your approach in order to educate them during the first two years? Yeah. For us, it's been all about changing the narrative. So, the, so let's say you are a government official in charge of, well, it doesn't matter which department. Typically, environmental organizations would approach you and convince you that we have to protect the ocean because it's polluted and overfished. And we did something very different. We actually said, you know, hey, we are we have a we have a, a, a new sort of business model where we employ veterans from the military, from the navy. We work in these areas with high unemployment, and we're going to create the jobs there. And we do that because we also ultimately at the same time help to restore and research nature at sea. But that was kind of almost like a smaller thing we talked about. So what you suddenly have is you're bringing a social economic proposal to government. It's about job creation for young people and veterans. It's about supporting people that have served in the armed forces, and it's a business model. So ultimately, it feeds a very, you could say, more conservative narrative. It's something that kind of is it's very accessible for establishment to say, okay, this is something we, we want to get behind. And it also was in how we approach government. On the very first day, you know, we were, I mean, we almost looked like corporate lawyers the way we stepped into the building. And in a ministry government department where everyone is sort of fairly casual the first thing people say to us is like oh this is not what we expected <laughs> you know from an environmental program so it's about those preconceptions people have which are quite silly but we use them and people would actually say wow this is not what i expected so then in their brain a little door opens like oh well maybe there's other things because this is not what i expected it to be which means they're more open-minded to what you have to say and these are very simple things about persuasion but they work and You know, this is something ultimately how we changed the narrative and also positioned us as a very non-traditional environmental organization that actually has helped us to get financial support and political support where ocean conservation normally would never get it. And I think that's really been the power of how we sort of changed the mindset of people on how to approach these issues in our work. This persuasion like trick, is, as you said, is all about, I think it's called framing as well. It's just sure. about set a frame which puts you in a certain category, which they didn't expect it. And that puts you in a very different position yeah. from the start. Going back to the more NGO world that I've been involved in even before for years, you know, we always approach politics in the same way. You write a petition, you, know, you, you protest, you approach members of parliament. You are trying to change legislation. You have like traditional lobbyists. That's a very different, you know. So if you constantly do the same things, of course, government has a way of dealing with you. And so I think they also didn't quite know how to ex what to expect from us. And and we also said, I mean, at some point we and we were always very correct. And of course, we don't influence policy. We don't go into government and say we want to change the law. We say we just want to help you implement it. And that was also, I think, something where uh, after a while they realized that we were very correct and a little bit traditional in, in how we approach them, always with a smile, but we also wouldn't go away. So we'd also say, you know, unless we have a contract, we will keep coming back. <laughs> and I think they ultimately respected that and, and, and thought, you know, this is an or a company that we can do business with in, in sort of a new way. As you're talking about governments, your third do was, if I don't in that case, don't be afraid of governments. So yeah. can you explain a bit <laughs> what, what you mean there when you said consider them as launching customers? Yeah. So, so interesting. So one of the first investors we met, or quite a few of the first investors, when we mentioned government as a client, 
they would all be like, oh, this, oh, you don't do that. And it's so much risk. And, you know, it's really difficult and it's going to take forever. And, and there's some truth in that. You know, it's not always easy. But government is also, of course, a client that can give us permission to operate at sea and do the kind of work we do. But ultimately, they're responsible for the ocean management. So being able to have them on board as partners is really crucial. And if they do support you in the longer term, and if you are embedded in the policy, then, of course, you're in a very powerful position whereby you can make that ongoing impact. So that is also something that, you know, interestingly, when the whole corona, the whole COVID situation started, we actually found that, first of all, the youth unemployment would be increasing massively. So suddenly local authorities, we would get contracts quicker during the corona pandemic for training young people, but also that different types of sustainable innovations that government was actually pushing faster for them to happen, saying essentially, you know, the post-corona economic recovery should be sustainable, should be green. This is a moment of transition where we can also make some of those steps. And then actually government is a very powerful party. And of course, during the whole corona pandemic, government has been our most trusted and reliable client out of all of them. And so I think there's, yeah, sometimes this perception, and I think many social enterprises, of course, work with government agencies or with local councils or hospitals. Or, and actually those kind of public authorities, if you know how to work with them, there are a lot of opportunities that can be realized. When you mention you're not trying to lobby them, I think indirectly, aren't like just by working with them, you're having an influence with them because you say you're embedded in the policies. And lobbying is not a bad thing for me. It's like when you start to work with someone, you have a certain affinity, you build connections, and inevitably you start influencing each other. So you can't prevent that. And I think for me, I don't know what your opinion is on that, but I really think that the reason why the planet is so polluted right now, it's because the oil industry understood that very, very clearly from the beginning. But just for the sake of lobbying in terms of communication and working hand in hand, uh, the green industry should learn from the oil industry and should be able to yeah. really change that. And because we won't be able to change the world effectively if we don't do it this in the same way that the oil industry has, or yeah. the pharmaceutical yeah. industry has done it. No, let, uh, I mean, let, let me clarify that, of course. In fact, there is a very traditional maritime industry lobbyist who went sort of into retirement and started working with us. Uh, who has a lot of connections and knows how that very traditional lobbying kind of profession is is carried out. And that made a big difference. But ultimately, I think when government gets, if you're trying to work on implementation directly with government agencies, and in this case, we're talking about maritime research and enforcement agencies. Now, this is a world that is entirely closed off. You, They don't work really with any outside partners. So any idea that you're trying to influence policy that would mean our trust that we built with them would be gone instantly. So that is something you have to be really careful of. So we get quite a few requests from also NGOs, you know, and, the, and NGOs have an important role there to push for the changes. But of course, there's now so many, so much legislation and so many laws to protect the sea, but there's just not enough ships and people to care, to implement this. So this is where we see our role. But we often would be contacted by NGOs saying, oh, can you undersign this protest letter? Can you join our coalition? Can you... But we don't do that. We don't, we don't you know, inform consumers about what products to consume. We don't do our part of campaigning. We position ourselves in a very specific role. And it's a role that gives trust to government that they can do business with us in the way we do. Which is implementation. Yeah, absolutely. Is there something you want, would like to iterate on the fourth do, which is do focus on multiple impacts? I know you talked already about that, but is there something you would like to add here when you told me, in fact, when they are combined, the relevance of your work grows and even environmental protection can deliver on social economic impacts? Mm. So the current transition we are, well, that the world is instigating towards a more sustainable future, uh, a more renewable way of running this economic system. That is happening, but we need to make sure that it also encompasses a very, very strong element of social sustainability. You know, if the social sort of injustice and the social inequality around the world persists, sure, we can have environmental protection, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily serve humanity. Whereas actually a lot of building renewable energy sources, uh, restoring landscapes, changing our food and agriculture systems, a lot of those models increasingly encompass a social impact element. And it's so important because it actually means that where miners and, and fishermen and, uh, and others are, you know, losing out on increasingly on jobs, 
they often people can be retrained to install solar panels to be see wheat farmers of the coast. I mean, and so that transition has to be social. And interestingly, when we first started this, we would speak to funders and investors, and they tell us, no, no, we have an sustainable fund and we have a social fund <laughs> and you know you need to make a decision which is more important and we'd be like no 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 we you know yeah give me both we, uh, yeah we want both so and so i think <laughs> so there is a realization that it's happening but i would definitely say to people that sort of you know go into this field especially on the kind of climate or environmental entrepreneurship and and want to have that social focus is to don't be afraid to be very vocal about the fact that that often these these impacts are combined that's its strength you know, the reason that President Roosevelt managed to get, you know, very broad backing politically in the U.S., like uncommonly so across the aisle in the 1930s for these programs, was because ultimately there were a huge economic incentive for the regions where the landscapes were restored. And it's exactly the case for us, you know, that combined impact is crucial. So it's just something I wanted to point out that, you know, don't be um, dissuaded by people who constantly also ask me, now, I know you're working with the young people, but surely the ocean protection is more important, right? And then you speak to another person and they say, no, I know you protect the ocean, but surely you really do it for the young people. <laughs> so people, you know, and that's totally fine. People give different sort of meanings to it for themselves. So you let the people decide which meaning they want to have associate with you. That's the advantage of having both as well. And, and that's the same thing that goes around, you know, not just working with like-minded people. It's this notion that people come in they might have a very different viewpoint from you. They might have a very different background, but it might be a specific part of this work that they really like. Then get them on board, you know. And I think in the environmental movement, there is often a little bit of a pitfall that we're trying to mobilize people who, you know, are sort of all encompassing, who, you know, are totally buying into the entire messaging around protecting nature. And and we need to mobilize more broadly, you know. Otherwise, we're not gonna we're not gonna make it. Totally agree. So you're talking about multiple impacts and because you have so many different projects that you are running in parallel, I'd like to talk a minute about how you use Asana, the project management tool, to run your organization efficiently. The reason why Asana is behind this episode is because I'm a certified pro coach of Asana. I was such a geek and a fan of Asana in my previous company that one day when I met the team in Berlin, they told me you should become a certified coach for us. And that's what I did. So I passed the test and the training there. And now from time to time, some of my clients are actually organizations that I'm coaching or I'm coaching their team on how to use Asana and how to implement it efficiently with all the teams together. So earlier this year, I was looking for our next guest for this podcast. And so, you know, I reached out a bit everywhere and I reached out on the Slack of Asana to see like, hey, do you know any inspiring companies of a sustainable mission? And actually some people at Asana referred you and this is how we got in touch. And you told me that Asana actually helps you to, to restore the ocean. So I was like, okay, this is going to be a, a perfect episode in terms of mission. And maybe Asana wanted to be a sponsor of this episode. And the, the reality is that they agreed. So thanks to them. Can you explain us a bit, you know, when did you start using Asana? And uh, what were the kind of needs or problems you were trying to solve with, yeah. with it? So so first of all, what we started is something very ambitious because we're doing a lot of different things at the same time, working with many partners. So keeping track of all those goals, projects, timelines, you know, tasks, deadlines, I mean, it, it gets like too complicated. So Asana really gives a unique overview because it allows people to work very independently. And yeah, looking at different sort of tools, ultimately Asana, we started using it a year ago and we're incredibly happy because it forms like a very strong sort of backbone for the, the company on how we organize our work. So we're big Asana fans, and I would say that our, again, our ocean restoration work is possible because of Asana helping us along the way, essentially. What kind of benefits did you find with it that you might not have found with other products? Because there are yeah. tons of solutions, and it's just your use case. You know, I always say some people are good with other software, like project management tools. So why in that case, which other tools have you considered and why did you stick with Asana? Yeah, so I mean, we used things like Trello before and Basecamp and, and those tools work really well. I think if you work in a, in a team, you know, that can really work. But again, for us, it, it's a sheer scale of at which things are, are operating. The key focus for Asana that made was a game changer for us is the fact that it's so task driven. So actually, I think what people sometimes forget when they're in a meeting 
and they're make and they're discussing in the team and what's your the only thing that matters at the end is what are the tasks, what is the context of those tasks, and when should they be carried out, right? When is the deadline? And that fits into a bigger sort of timeline of when you want to get stuff done. And so I think there's so much, as Asana also calls it, work about work, that actually the promise I think that Asana gives of like, if you properly implement that, you can get up to 30% of your time back actually rank true for us. I would suddenly get, gain a lot of time because instead of people emailing me about things and the other people responding or I just look in Asana and I can see the status of a task and I don't have to ask people. I can see where things stand. It's very transparent. So it opens up this possibility of people working more, you know, with more autonomy. And it also makes kind of the sort of nature of the work as such that that coupled with the fact that, you know, just over a year ago with the whole uh, COVID situation starting up, that the remote working kind of goes hand in hand with people working more autonomously in their role. So I think if you guide that properly, then in, in the case of our staff, I think people have been very yeah, receptive to it. And, you know, they don't have to wait on on a manager or someone else before they can continue with other types of work. Asana gives that insight. And um, there's always another task to uh, <laughs> to carry out. Yes, you always have more tasks. But I also agree with you that's especially the offline part, but it's also a process to get as a company. When I was CMO in my previous company, and then we used it across two different sites, and myself, for example, just for meetings, the fact that I had to do the one-on-ones every month, you save so much time when you have these meeting plan in advance and everybody fills in the, the task and the information and reports about the status of where everything is at. And then su- suddenly your meeting is, instead of being one hour of discussing live about what everything has been done, you people fill it in before and then you just discuss about you know the points that are not clear or that should be discussed actually. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just complex work that it brings it into context, I think, you know, and it's Asana also has this sort of notion of the pyramid, right? So where you have your sort of big vision and mission of the organizations, you have your sort of key objectives, the goals to reach those objectives, and then ultimately you have the, you know, your subtasks and your projects and, and, and it, it all boils down. So it's also a question of how do you inspire people in your team, in your, in your company, especially if it grows quickly, to say, what am I doing today? What is this kind of uninspiring little task about, you know, providing some further financial information to, let's say, a partner or an investor? Okay, that's something you have to do. But how does that fit into the bigger picture of what we're doing? And where are we with our impact and, and our goals as well? So I think that's also something, especially in our line of work, to be continually inspired about the fact that every little thing we do builds up towards that bigger mission and goal is also something that I think that Asana provides. It provides that, that context. You have a specific use case. You told me that all the, the ships have actually Asana installed on, on the phones yeah. or iPads, and then yeah. it can sync offline. <laughs> and then like, when ships are back on land, it synchronizes. So this is something we've now started implementing. I think we may be the first company in the world to use Asana in this way, like on offshore ships, because that's, you know, Asana is, I guess, still relatively new and the maritime industry moves them slowly, let's say. Um, <laughs> But of course, yeah, very empowering. So if our sea rangers are out at sea and, for example, something needs replacing on the deck or there is a maintenance thing or someone has to clean a filter in the engine because we still have an engine room or, you know, something with the sails needs to be uh, replaced, then that it's in Asana. You know, all these tasks are, are in Asana. So we organize the operation of our ships through Asana. And uh, one last question on that topic. How have you implemented it? Did you get some help for someone or how did you implement it through the team? Because I, I guess as well, you work with the whole tools from Asana, from the you know OKRs, goals, objectives, portfolio yeah. and everything. So how have you done that? Yeah. As a CEO, I decided to step up myself in the sense that I trained to be an Asana ambassador and actually do the initial trainings myself. Okay. To really take people along and why is this important? It's also fair, you know, people, they become sea rangers, they're out at sea, they're working on a ship. The last thing they really, you know, want is to learn about software. Like that's not really a, a passion for them necessarily, right? So in order to make it relevant to people, in order to, yeah, really get them on board, it's really, I think, needed my involvement that of other staff. But we still have some way to go. I think that you can... The, the full implementation of Asana and making sure, and so I've become, become quite strict. I don't want to receive any emails from staff. You know, I want them to contact me in Asana, right? So that takes a bit of time. And of course, if someone sends on an email from an external person, that, that's still an email. But so yeah, these, you know, it's, 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 I think, so far an inspiring journey and we'll stay on course. Before moving to the next part of the episode, 
If that conversation sparkled your interest regarding Asana, you can go to gtimpact.com slash saves the world with Asana. gtimpact.com slash saves the world with Asana. I'll put the link in the resource of this episode. On that page, you can find a link to try the premium version of Asana for free during 30 days. And if you need support in order to implement Asana best within your whole organization, feel free to reach out to me on that page and I'll be happy to discuss how I can help you on that task. So now let's go for the next part of this episode. So to move to the next part and the last do actually you sent me, which is a big one, which is do dream big. Can you explain us a bit more about this? It took many years for me because I was always someone that worked in the background. Any company or organization I worked at, I wasn't really center stage as a person. And that's just not my personality. But yeah, equally, I sort of had this idea and I thought, you know, this is something that needs to happen. So a lot of it, of course, is about having the self-confidence to say, actually, this needs to happen. I'm going to do something about it. And then, you know, similarly, as I previously mentioned, this sort of naivety that people would perceive the ambition of the work with. It's about being sort of unapologetically ambitious. And when we're talking about the climate crisis and a lot of the crises we have in our food system and oceans and biodiversity, we really have to scale solutions fast over the coming sort of decade, decade or two. So, yeah, do dream big. And I think especially as a social entrepreneur, some people sometimes tell me, oh, there is no, not, just, not such a thing as a social business because it is simply a business. And I don't really believe that because we do even though we are developing business models and, and revenue streams to make sure that our work is profitable, there is still a lot of recognition for the fact that you're doing something with a social benefit and that it's a societal benefit. And so there's a, a lot of willingness from corporates and from government and others to step in and to help assist with that. And to give you sort of a couple of examples, PwC, you know, met with the partners in the Netherlands and they started to support us in this huge ways, entirely pro bono. So for free, we had like many consultancy hours and any kind of tax issues or things around public procurement or legal queries would just be dealt with because the people at PwC thought, wow, this is, a, you know, if this is a kind of business model, really cool. And ultimately, if they make profit, that can go back into the mission. So there's, you know, there's that willingness. And of course, if you have a purely commercial company, and that's nothing bad with that, but it's more difficult to get this kind of support, you know, because they would just send you an invoice. Um, and similarly, what we have done to ensure that we can replicate this success of the Sea Ranger model in other countries is that we developed a franchising model. So we believe it may be the first or one of the first times that a conservation solution is replicated through franchising. And the thinking was like, well, what is, you know, what are some of the most successful franchises out there? If McDonald's can sell burgers really efficiently using franchising and then Starbucks can sell coffee around the world and Ikea can, you know, get their flat pack furniture in everyone's home around the world. Surely there is something we can learn here from corporate business because they have simply found a methodology that's really, really effective. So we ended up at Ikea and the, we worked in sort of this sort of program within Ikea. We met with the CEO, with the CFO. We had like various senior legal people in Ikea that helped us literally to understand, well, how does an Ikea franchise work? How is an Ikea store run? And if that same efficiency can be applied to Sea Ranger ships, you know, wow, there's a lot of potential there. So they developed us to, um, with us, a franchise model. And that's now replicated. You know, initially, we're going to start uh, scaling to the UK from later this year, Norway, South Africa, some other countries on the cards. So it's really, I think, you know, I would have never thought that I'd sit down with the CEO of IKEA and learning their sort of trade secrets on how they run their company. But actually, there's that willingness. And so dreaming big, while realistic, and you need to have a clear plan. But it also, I think, people buy into that ambition over time if you can be seen to be realistically taking steps to achieve that. And even now in the Netherlands, but also in the UK, the military is coming on board, you know, more structurally. We have the different kind of rescue services at sea that help train our sea rangers. You know, as I said, there are banks that are now essentially saying we're going to invest in the shipbuilding side of things. More governments. We have at the highest levels of various governments, you know, now the conversations. So I would have never dreamed of this being possible like five years ago. And we're now at the stage where increasingly there is that recognition and we can take those steps. So however small you start, do dream big because the world needs it. And, you know, it's something that over time 
have the trust in the fact that people are going to back you and are going to give you the support you need to get further up that ladder and further scale the impact. I just think, yeah, not giving up and, and really sticking to your course in that sense is um, yeah, it's really vital. It's a great last do. From what I'm learning with you, I would also say that do look at different verticals to get inspired because, you know, your example of how you found this idea of training the, the Sea Rangers coming from this inspiration from Roosevelt program in the 30s. Now this franchising being like inspired by IKEA is actually, it is how the greatest innovation, even the music industry, if you think about it, goes. It's like you, you look at different styles, genres, and you, you steal. And here you're doing the same thing. You don't steal it yeah. directly, but you just apply it and get inspired by that. So I really yeah. like that idea. And it's a recognition also of the fact that it is about having that cross-disciplinary kind of approach. One thing I love about the fact that it also boils down to individual people. You know, our Sea Rangers, there is a sense of pride and identity that they take from being a Sea Ranger. Even though they have different reasons, it works for them. It's something very personal. Perhaps the maybe final anecdote that I think was for me quite a sort of a unique moment, really. So I was at this TV show in the Netherlands. I was on, it was like a live TV show. And at the end of the show, we finished and some people were having drinks. This is a couple of years ago. And so a woman came up to me and she was like, oh, I you know, love the work you do. And I was like, oh, thank you. And she was like, oh, I'm not sure what I can do, but you know, I would love to support it in some way. And I asked her, I was like, well, so what do you do? Like, what's your profession or your skills? And, and she was like, well, I'm a dentist. And, and I thought like, well, you know, I'm sure our sea rangers could use dental care. Like that is something in potential you could provide. <laughs> now, it might seem like something really silly, but the fact that someone can be mobilized, even a dentist with their skills to have a small role into running a ranger service and helping to protect those oceans. That is something so powerful, you know, and I think if anything gives sort of promise to a better future is the fact that everyone can be mobilized based on their own intrinsic motivation and skills and passion. So did that woman end up like giving services, like dental services? Yeah, yeah. So we're still in touch. Of course, the whole corona thing made it a little bit tricky, but we're, yeah, we're talking about the fact that that dental care becomes available. But that is, I think, something so powerful. Really try to understand whoever is on the on the other side of, of sitting in front of you. Really try to understand what motivates those people and appeal to that to strengthen also your mission. You know, it's something that, that really inspired me. It's ordinary people that make that difference. Before getting to the usual last questions I asked my guests, two small questions is regarding growth, what has been your growth strategy to get more donation, more attract more talent, get more clients, get more like investors on board, because investors can invest too. How have you, which channels have you used? What, what has been your communication and growth strategy? Yeah, Ashoka is a network of social entrepreneurs, of about 3,000 globally. And I was elected an Ashoka Fellow a few years ago. And that's made a really big difference because there's quite a few social impact investors that are actively involved in this network. There is an organization called FASA, the Financing Agency for Social Entrepreneurship. They are based in Germany, the Netherlands, a few other countries. And I think if you have a social enterprise and you're looking to raise any kind of financing, they are really amazing at, at offering support and, and guidance. How do you call that one? FASA. So it's uh, the Financing Agency for Social Entrepreneurship. And yeah, and it's really been a case of getting out there, going to all types of events, you know, speaking as much about our work as possible, getting yourself out there pretty much nonstop. But again, I mean, we're now, you know, getting close to, it's been like over five years since we started. So that's obviously also, we're now getting to a stage where we have sort of built that network over time. And then really some of our existing investors who invested further and who are introducing us to others you know, to scale on. And then ultimately our big search, you could say, or our big sort of one of the obstacles moving forward is that in the other countries where we want to, you know, get a franchise up and running, we just need really good entrepreneurs to essentially establish those franchises. Uh, and because they're franchises, anybody can approach us and can apply and can work with us to, to establish a franchise. But there's just a lot involved with, of course, the training and the ships and the, and the contracting. I will put the links to the Ashoka and Faza oh, yeah. here on the notes of the episode. Which brings me to like one of the last questions I was curious about was, you know, I, I've interviewed like Paul Watson in, in this podcast on the first season, second episode, super interesting, inspiring uh, interview for me. And you also told me that you worked three years for Sea Shepherd. So maybe one thing is, what have you learned there that you've applied in your company? And what 
differentiate you from Sea Shepherd? I, I heard that you mm. mentioned at some point the word legally. I know that sometimes they also decided to show the way and to act their interventionist association. So what's your stake on that? So look, when I was young, you know, I, I saw a very sort of increasingly changing environment around me and realized that we need to act for nature. So I essentially became involved in what was most accessible were NGOs, some activist groups. I think that really helped shape for me the urgency of the issue that we work on and the fact that you as an individual, and especially if you work together with others, can really make a difference, can make an impact. And so I also worked with WWF and Greenpeace and I, I filled with Sea Shepherd. And, but after a few years, I think I realized that, again, you know, th there's so little capacity. It's all reliant on donations and volunteers. It's just not a way to scale true impact. And actually, governments are very adverse to working with NGOs and, and activist groups, probably for you know understandable reasons, because they're trying to influence and, 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 and change things uh, to a point where it's very difficult to, for governments to work with those organizations directly. So with the Sea Range Service, we said, we're not going to work with any NGOs. We're not going to partner with any activist groups. We're going to put ourselves entirely in the realm of maritime industry, government agency affiliation, military affiliation. And that essentially meant that I took a back step in a way also have pushed back a little bit on the activism, because I think there is a point to argue that while activism seems to be the most direct way of intervening and making a difference, ultimately we have been involved as a society in all types of activism for the last 30, 40 years on the environmental awareness. And we have a lot of new laws and legislation in place. And those laws can't be enforced so should we continually push for more laws and, and more legislation when we can't even enforce what we already have? So with the Sea Rangers, we're just trying to do something a, a little bit differently. But, you know, I'll be the first to say when I was younger, that was what inspired me to actually go out there and, and just take action and do something. And we do that now in the same way with the Sea Rangers, service, just with a slightly different approach. What's your opinion on the movie um, Sea Spiracy? Like, uh, is the fishing industry so crooked? Look, the the movie of course, highlights a lot of really important points. And on the whole, it's that it pretty much paints the picture of the impact we have on our oceans. There were a few points in the documentary that were like factually incorrect, which I think is a real shame because it kind of undermines maybe the messaging they gave. Uh, on the other hand, you know, this is produced with Netflix. It has like a huge global reach and it's done a lot to raise awareness on, on ocean issues that then activate people. And so in that regard, we need so much more of this to make people aware and get them on board. So of course, all our sea rangers as well, they all watched it. You know, we actually had internally, we also discussed it as a team. And I think the general consensus was like, we might've made some different decisions if we produced it ourselves, but the fact that it's made and those people made it and got it out there, it's, it's a big achievement. And, you know, the, one of the issues is, it's what was called, it's called sea blindness. And it's actually this notion of, we don't really see what happens on the water. You know, when you stand on the beach, you just see kind of the, the waves rolling in. But if you were aware of really what happened at scene and the public could see it, they wouldn't stand for it. So how can you make that more transparent? How can you, you know, really take people in that ocean environment and make them aware of what's happening? Um, and that's, of course, something the film did, uh, yeah, did really well. What were one of the facts that were not true, for example, or not accurate? Yeah, so, so one of the things, one of the claims uh, they make, and I've been guilty in the past of it, is referring to the ocean being empty by 2048 that all commercially exploited fish stocks will be potentially gone by then. Now, that's actually a fact that's been reputed since then. In fact, the, even the scientists that first came up with this conclusion have corrected that since. So the ocean will not be empty within like 20 years. That, that is not what's happening. In fact, in some cases, a good ocean and fisheries management is helping to restore certain fishing stocks. So there are also you know, positive things that are happening. There's still a lot of work to be done, and in some cases, you know, things are going really drastically wrong. Don't get, you know, don't misunderstand me. But it's, you know, when you put such a number out there, when even the scientists that have come up with this conclusion themselves have already said, well, actually, you know, this is not true anymore. Then, when a few years later you continue to use such a fact, I think that's, yeah, that's a bit of an oversight. Really, you have to really make sure you get the facts uh, straight. You know, generally speaking, when we look at nature, when nature is left to its own devices without human intervention often it takes care of itself. And in the case of the ocean, restoring seagrass and bringing oyster beds back, that is just helping nature along. But ultimately, it's just about giving nature a break. And I think with the sea ranges, we're able to help manage the ocean better in the future. And we're hopefully able to increasingly also be involved in managing marine protected areas, which are these areas at sea where 
yeah, nature can just be left to its own devices, and then nature will rebound, um, you know, very quickly. Talking about the last questions, the usual ones. What is the best advice you've been given as an entrepreneur? Oh, it's just to believe in yourself and keep going. I mean, I, I've sort of, you know, I've talked upon this that in the beginning people thought what we were doing was crazy, and and only after a while did you know did we convince everyone that it was possible. So we actually spent three and a half, four years just pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, and you just you know really have to have to be pretty yeah determined. So don't be dissuaded. But then again, I mean, you need to listen to critical voices around you as well. So I think that's also a thing. You have to get a little bit of a feel of, you know, what advice can you ignore and what advice should you totally take on, you know, in, in moving forward. How do you do that? Because that's a critical part. Do you have a special trick? Now, look, I'll, I'll be the first one to, I think, say also that, and I, I've just written a book about many of these things as well and about how starting the C-Range service. The process of writing a book, but it's the same in the process of, of starting a company. It's also an egoistic kind of exercise because you have a feeling in yourself that says actually i think i have something that can really work and i believe in myself and you know and i'm the person that's going to make this happen so you know to what extent is that valid and i think as much as there were critical voices there was also a lot of people who actually said you know the way you're going this is really good but think about this and make sure you don't make that mistake so i think it's just having a lot of critical voices around you and of course if a lot of people are telling you the same thing you should really take it on board but it's also understandable in our case you know, we really did something innovative. And especially in, like, say, a more traditional maritime industry, you're also going to run into people who just don't quite understand it and think it's a bit strange, you know, and, and are dismissive. Um, and that's definitely something you should kind of gently push aside while, you know, as a younger generation, we move things uh, forward. Which book would you recommend entrepreneurs like you to read? Oh, that's a good one. There's a really amazing book uh, called Eat Like a Fish. And it's about this amazing entrepreneur in the U.S. who set up seaweed farms off the coast. And he's involved in like regenerative ocean farming. Brent Smith is his name. And he runs this organization called Green Waves. And he's basically he's sort of reinventing farming, but on the ocean, which has a lot of benefits. And it's a very non-intensive way of agriculture, of, of aquaculture, essentially. So that's a really inspiring book because he's a, like a former fisherman who, you know, sailed out on you know, involved in very destructive fishing and actually turned to now restoring the ocean through producing seaweed. So I think that that's really definitely a big recommendation of a book of another, you could say kind of a, you know, also someone who has the environmental impact, but also the social one. So he works with former farmers from the Midwest. He trains them at seaweed farmers, you know, and, and, and really makes that social impact as well. It's very, very inspiring stuff. I will add it to the notes. Do you have any podcast or influencers you follow on YouTube or LinkedIn that you would recommend entrepreneurs to follow? I'm going to have a very boring answer here. <laughs> and while I listen to a lot of that, actually, one of the biggest motivators and inspirations for me has been about learning about history. It's actually looking at where are the challenges we face today? Where did the world face similar challenges in the past? And are there actually, with all the high-tech solutions that often people develop, can actually be some of the answers we need for a more sustainable future? Can they, in fact, be found in the past? And so learning about the environmental destruction in the early you know, 1930s in the U.S., where there was you know, such a need for ecological regeneration, learning how an administration and under the command of, of President Roosevelt, that was changed back then. That's been a huge inspiration for me. So... I actually spend more time in, in national archives over the last few years than I think I do listening to all type of entrepreneurs on, on how they scale businesses. And so I think that is, it, it's maybe I've, I've had a neck over time for finding inspiration on how to run my business, not from the more traditional business kind of content providers. And that helped me to get to gain different perspectives uh, as well. And so to find these different perspectives on history, it's a bit mostly, you said, in national archives, so libraries and... Uh... Yeah, or but it may also be, for example, when we set up our sea rangers, one of the things I did was actually go to my local library and read up on how like the Royal Navy started as a navy. How did they used to build ships? How did they used to finance them? How did they used to recruit young people to well and back many years ago that was very different from now. But you can learn certain things of how things are done that actually help to inspire us. And even I, the inspiration for the uniform of our sea rangers comes from some history books of seeing what has worked in the past. So, yeah, I mean, obviously I'm on Twitter and Instagram and I follow some amazing 
uh, entrepreneurs, but I definitely think I would very much encourage people to look a little bit beyond that and try and find inspiration in lots of different fields and try and apply them to what it is that you're working on. Very good one. I didn't have that one yet, so uh, be happy to share it. Go see history books and I agree. It goes back to what you explained before and how we discussed about finding inspiration in different verticals or in that case, timeline. Can you tell us one thing about you that I wouldn't be able to find out online? I originally studied to become a violin maker. A violin maker? Yeah. So I'm currently making a cello. And while I don't do it professionally anymore, I have a workshop at home. And my sort of meditation moment on a Sunday is to do the woodwork. And I'm making a cello now. So there's definitely, even though now I'm sort of very high over all this talk of policy and, you know, developing the business and but actually working with my hands that is something that i've really enjoyed as well to really learn a craft and i've done that professionally for about 10 years and then ultimately decided to yeah to start the sea ranger service ah so you've done that you, you were uh, like a violin cello maker for professionally yeah. for 10 years yeah so i've gone from i've gone from the perspective of tens of millimeters in the woodwork to <laughs> the millions of square miles of ocean. So the, the sort of macro, micro kind of thinking has, has very much been embedded, <laughs> I think, for a while. But it's, yeah, and interesting, actually making, you know, if I give you some blocks of wood and some tools and I say, make a violin, you probably look at me like, are you crazy? Where do I need to start? <laughs> and you learn that it's all about methodologies, right? And it's about taking care of one part and then going to the next and refining your craft after time. So that's a similar methodology I applied to this Sea Ranger service. When people in the beginning said, like, how are you going to build a ship? And I actually thought, well, in a really, really basic notion, building a ship is pretty much similar to building a cello, right? It's about finding the right materials and following the methodologies of how to do that. It's a project that you can manage in stages. So I think that also helped me to to think, well, I, I'm sure it's possible. You know, if someone's done this before the shipbuilding, I don't see any reason why if we can't build ships for industry, we can't build them for conservation too. Thank you very much, Vitsa, for this uh, fantastic and very inspiring and insightful interview. Last thing, do you have anything you would like to communicate with our audience? I will share the websites, you know, searangers.org. I will share it in the notes of the episode. So we need a lot of people to get on board, of course, to make this mission a success. This is a quite overall, there's a lot that has to be done. We have a number of new vacancies coming up. We're currently looking for a communications manager who essentially had all the sort of brand building around our brand uh, more globally. There will be sort of an operational assistant role coming in. And I would anticipate that over the next six months, there's a number of different roles that we're going to have to start advertising on the back end of a big investment round we're closing in the coming weeks. So searangers.org slash jobs is where we post all these uh, these jobs postings. The other thing is that we are now scaling into, for example, the UK. And there we will start an initial financing round specifically for the UK expansion. So that is also something where, of course, our people are interested in potentially investing. They want to receive further information, uh, an investment profile. And so we can send that. So really, I would say if there's anything in this conversation that sort of rings true or something you want to know more about, please contact us. Go to our website. You know, there's a contact uh, page and, and just reach out. And none of this, what we have achieved up till now, would have been possible without support of so many people that have come on board and, and sort of also took a sense of ownership over this work. So in that sense, there are still a lot of people that we've never met that are hopefully waiting in the wings to take this mission further. So um, yeah, I very much look forward to people that potentially perceive them for themselves to be a role there. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best with Sea Ranger Service and your mission of restoring the ocean biodiversity and training all these new young people. If you like this episode, you can share it with your friends because sharing is caring. And you can give it a five star on Apple podcast because this really helps to make it more visible to other entrepreneurs working on a better future like you. If you are busy and might not have the time to listen to all episodes of this podcast, just a little tip. Sign up for my newsletter on gtimpact.com. You will receive the summary of advice from each episode and you will get personal recommendations on which episode you should focus on depending on your current challenges, your industry, and your startup stage. Thank you very much and see you next week for the next episode. Have a nice day.